Check, check, one, two, test, test. I can't remember what they said on the... Yeah, we'll definitely have to tell them to keep their mics off. Where is... Where is my... I'm going to stop. Right. Good, thing. Good thing we had somebody here who knew Zoom. All right. And then we'll do this. All right. Okay, Greg, let's hope this is all going to work. Uh, I'm Justin Evertson with the Nebraska Forest Service and Statewide Arboretum. Thank you for coming tonight. We see some familiar faces from Greg's grafting workshop this morning. Uh, nobody lost a finger, right? Not a lot of blood. And everybody came out of there with two, uh, maybe trees that we can get to grow. <laughs> yeah, Greg was here this morning helping us graft. He's been across the state the last uh, two days. He was out in McCook with us to do the same thing two days ago. Bruce Hoffman is on from McCook. He's the owner of Common Sense Nursery and co-sponsor of this event. So thank you, Bruce. We really appreciated that. We told him that McCook was a trial run so that when we got to the big city, we'd have it all ironed out and do a good job. So Greg promises me that tonight he will do that. Uh, <laughs> it was good. I'm telling you, this is a good uh, program. I'm, any of us like Tom Gibbons here, you've been around trees a long time. Eileen, you've grown trees all your life. So many of us are fascinated by the diversity of trees that we can get to grow around us. Uh, we're tree nuts, right? And we keep our eyes at the trees looking for them to see what um, maybe we should be trying to grow. And one of the special tree nuts of the world is Greg Morganson here. <laughs> he's, uh, I don't want to guess how long he's been doing this kind of work, but across the Great Plains from North Dakota to Kansas, and then he has family in Nebraska. So he comes here a lot. And I've just always been fascinated at how much he knows about trees and is willing to share. And so Greg, thank you for coming. He didn't charge us a dime to come do this. He got in his car up in Bismarck, North Dakota the other day and drove down and he was like, well, that's just a regular day for me. So, uh, well, without further ado, uh, why don't you come up on up here, Greg Morganson, and we'll get you going here. You can let the people know all your accomplishments in life, or maybe we'll have John do it and uh, his brother, John, here, and uh, we'll get the truth about it. Okay, thanks for coming, Greg. Thank you. I'm gonna keep my water here. I was telling everybody, I haven't given a presentation in, purpose, in person since January of 20, so it's been several years. And then I also retired in the fall of 20, and so my wife works and I'm at home with two cats and they're basically the only ones I have to talk to. So I was so sore Wednesday in my throat. It was hard to speak actually, because we, it was a long day with the grafting and a presentation and a lot of people wanted to talk about things. So it was, uh, it was quite a change for me from the life I've been living. I'm gonna talk about a number of things. This isn't a real specific fancy talk. I do a lot of talks for for nursery groups and associations. And mostly they've been through the Dakotas, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado. So getting into Southeast Nebraska is, uh, I said this morning, this is like a subtropical area for me, actually. We screwed this up already, Okay. You, could, you should just speak up. Well, this uh, the button, uh, the green one. Nope, nope, not that one. And then you're also going to want to make sure everybody is muted as well. Otherwise, since it's recording, everyone will be hearing everyone else talking, even though we can't hear them. Okay. <laughs> Okay, good. 
All right. Okay. Help. I'm sorry if we interrupted that. <laughs> oh. Great. We're off and running now. Good luck, Greg. <laughs> See you, Justin. <laughs> so anyway, I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, trees that are suited this area. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of trees you can grow here that I'm not even going to touch on. I tried to jump into just some uh, uh, trees that have cultivars or how we do selection. Um, a little bit of my background, originally from Kansas, so grew up in Kansas, moved to Lincoln my senior year of high school when my dad was transferred up here. Um, gradually worked my way through UNL here through a number of jobs and uh, working away from UNL a number of jobs. So um, kind of at, uh, at all points was trying to get a background in tree work. I actually started in 74 with Bismarck, uh, not Bismarck, my wife works for Bismarck Parks, for Lincoln Parks and Recreation in their forestry division. I started in 74 as a tree climber, back when we climbed the trees and trimmed them and you, you know, hanging from a rope with a pole saw and a chainsaw running in front of your face. Um, did that for several years, got onto uh, um, bucket truck operation. I was telling them this morning, we were the guys that would go in and totally decimate those neighborhoods here in Lincoln that were full of American elm that would be turned into deserts when we were done because we had to get ahead of Dutch elm disease. So, and then they went in and planted them all back to green ash and all those are going out now. And then they planted, you know, and streets I've come across, I, I should have put slides in, I planted them all to autumn blaze maple now. So we just keep shifting our monocultures and we've got to get the whole diversity thing in our head. And they don't even have to be same genera or form or anything, just, just mix them up. So, um, was here at, at UNL, um, worked with Dr. Gustafson for a couple of years at the establishment of the nut tree program, uh, went up to North Dakota in 82 in the big re recession of 82. Does anybody here remember that? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> Jobs were almost non-existent at that time and there was a position up there. So then I worked 29 years with the North Dakota Soil Conservation District's nursery where we grew about anywhere from three to five million seedlings a year and distributed through the entire plain states, Kansas through Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and, and adjoining states to North Dakota. So it was a really good background in propagation. And then the last eight years, I got back into ornamental trees at the NDSU um, Woody Plant Improvement Program. And I'm no longer with them, but I didn't change the slide. I was grabbing slides from programs, but the NDSU program, um, is one of the few remaining tree selection and improvement programs in the country. Um, there's just a few Oregon State, North Carolina State, NDSU. Um, most states have eliminated their programs, but uh, ours is still pretty active and very, very highly supported by the university, So, which is, which is great. So with that, I'm just going to talk about the plains a little bit, the reason that we do tree selection, and then a number of different tree species. Uh, just real quickly, most people um, kind of think of North Dakota as, as you know, uh, soybean and cornfields, but we've got a nice 60 acre arboretum, thousands of accessions there of tree material, started by Dr. Dale Herman back in the 70s. Dale has since retired, but he still gives us his input. And, um, there's, you know, the road through here and around here, it, it's an amazing place to work. It, it has to have been one of my favorite places to work. Um, just an incredible area, an incredible collection of Northern Plains hardy plant material. And, and a lot of our selections come out of this because a lot of these have been seed propagated um, populations of seed propagated trees. And then we can do selections out of that in addition to other selections that come into our program. So. Just real quickly, uh, it's, a, it's an arboretum. It, it, um, the center, about 37 acres, is a large arboretum. Does a big um, horseshoe shape on the inside. Originally started as a horseshoe shape. It's all grown together. But so in the north and the right side, northwest side, we start with the A's. So all the acers, which are maples, esculus, ulnus, all of those materials. That's my old boss. Um, <laughs> 
all of those materials, uh, and then it continues down Betula, the birches, seas, Catalpa, Carplana. So, and then then swings clear around and ends ends on the uh, south uh, east side with the U's, Almas, uh, Elms, or the U's. So it's an alphabetical with every every letter or, or genera represented in there. We do a lot of work with. Uh, nursery industry they send us uh, there's several nurseries that send us actual selections that they want to see how absolutely hardy they're going to be in our country somebody may say it's a zone four or zone five you know does it have potential to go into zone 3b do we kill it in our area and that's the information they want whatever happens with it they want to know if we've killed it or it's done well um, whatever it could be and then, and then there's some, several other projects there. There's a uh, Juneberry selection breeding program, grape breeding program. So there's a lot of things going on on the farm. And I think a number of universities have these programs going on. I think UNL has a, has a uh, grape program also. But the big thing, living in the plains, and I'm sure you all know, is this working at all? Yeah, you know where Nebraska is. Here's North Dakota. Um, we have varying soil conditions and, and, and it's very limiting um, along with soil and moisture. I put this map up the other day and, and I told him I can't believe Nebraska is 6'4 to 6'7. Um, I don't recall pH is that low here. I'm sure there are some, but uh, you get up in our area and it's got 7'7. Seven, seven. Actually, most of our pHs are about 7, 8 to 8, 2. So it's very limiting. It's hard to grow a lot of plants in these high pH soils. So Part of our selection program is plant material adapted to those conditions. This is what soil induced, induced chlorosis does to trees. And you can see, you know, here's uh, birch and uh, one, of the, one of the maples. You know, they just do very, very poorly for us, but things do well. You know, the elms, virtually all of the elms love this compacted clay, high pH soil. Here's a little species over here called philodendron or cork tree. You know, so there are trees that do very well on some of these sites. Some of the things you can grow here, we can't grow at all. This is what it looks like when we try to grow some of these maple, swamp white oak, white pine. They just do not grow in our area. And we just basically tell people, don't try it unless you want to throw your money away. But uh, we do some research on rootstocks for these materials too, and, and do make them, uh, we are able to grow some of them on our sites, but basically the species just are not adapted. And I wanted to put the driest states in the continental US up here. And if you look in the center, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Wyoming, this whole section of the states are the driest states in the US in the winter. Uh, summer, you guys don't even make top 10 for driest. Uh, <laughs> I guess we don't either. But um, for the year, North Dakota is the eighth driest state in the country. South Dakota is the 10th. So we live in a very dry area. Fargo gets around 22 to 24 inches of precip on the east side. That tapers down to about 12 and a half to 13 inches on the west side, much like Nebraska, except you get a little more precip in both of those areas than we do. Um, I'm in Bismarck, which Bismarck is basically go to North Platte, go north 400 miles, and you're in Bismarck. And so we get about, uh, I've heard, I've seen a range, but anywhere from about average 16 to 18 per year. And I think we had less than 10 this last year. We're in a severe drought as many as you are. And then in the Western part of the state, I got to do my little promo for the national parks and places to visit. And so if you wanna, if you wanna do some nice camping, hiking, um, we used to have forests there 60 million years ago. I tell people we used to have metasequoia, ginkgo, catsura, magnolia, but uh, those days are long gone. But uh, you know, those fossils are pretty prevalent in some of those areas out there, which is amazing to me. This is my wife over here. She won't look at the camera. <laughs> so we, diversity is the big thing. And then you can call it a buzzword, but it really is what we need, you know, when you, Look at those streets that were planted, not with just even one species like American elm, but one cultivar like East Lincoln, which is all Marshall seedless ash. There is no genetic diversity when uh, pressures come in on those from insects or diseases. So what, what I've done for most of my career and 
and with the NDSU program. You know, we're actively looking for plants that are going to be adaptable to that region, uh, both pest wise, winter hardiness wise. Um, we're in zone 3B, 4A, so we've got to have plants that tolerate minus 35 to minus 40. Not quite the uh, pressure here, but you know, you do occasionally get cold here. And a lot of the, the current commercially available nursery cultivars are not suitable for our area. And I'm, I'm using our area up there. You got to kind of bear with me here. So, so a lot of our selection is, is for our northern zone for both the northern tier of the U.S. states and the Canadian provinces. And our, our plants are pretty widely used on both sides of the border there. I tell people I'm just, from just south of the border and they're, oh, really? Where are you? I say, well, it's North Dakota, just south of the border. And we need to increase plant diversity. There's a lot of insects and diseases, which you've all heard about. Of course, ash is the big one now with emerald ash borer. Um, elm, you know, we now have elms to replace a lot of those American elms that we lost. Spruce, we're getting hammered by three diseases up there. Uh, pine wilt nematode is wiping out introduced hard pines. So there's a, lo a lot of uh, issues we try to address. Plus, we're always trying additional genera for up in our area. And I mentioned, uh, I think I can go one more, yeah. One of my areas of interest is, and I mentioned it this morning on, on rootstocks, we were grafting apples, but most of the cultivars of uh, ornamental trees, uh, with the exception of, of some of the maples and a few of the others, are pretty much done by budding and grafting. So you can adjust the rootstocks on those. I mentioned um, swamp white oak. Uh, we cannot grow swamp white oak up there because of the high pH. When you graft that on a Northern Plains burrow, they grow perfectly well, deep, deep green, because that rootstock is adapted to, to uh, picking up that, that iron that it needs and, and all the other uh, um, elements that it needs on those high pH soils. So by varying a rootstock, you can grow a plant that you would not normally be able to grow in your area. And I'm going to use an example here. Uh, when we moved up there in 82, um, red buds were virtually unknown in that area. Most of the red buds come in, are grown um, um, from unknown sources or from southeast sources, whether it be, you know, Tennessee or Missouri, some of those areas. So even here, there's problems in hardiness of red bud at times. So I started looking for red buds. I drive a lot of towns on the way back and forth. I hate to take... Uh, High, uh, major highways all the time. I like to do two ways. You go to a little town, you drive through towns. And it's amazing all the plant material that is in the small towns from the plains, clear from you know Texas through Saskatchewan, because all that plant material wasn't native. It's all essentially been planted somehow. It's been brought in from somewhere. And over the years, that non-hardy material has been weeded out. And a lot of the materials that remain, especially in smaller towns with older plantings, are the plants that will do well here. So I'm always looking for, uh, I, I like red bud, grew up with red bud. My father always had red bud. My brother's got red buds. So I'm always looking for uh, older established plants and, and I found a number of them in South Dakota and Minnesota, which is kind of surprising because it's really out of their range of use. But uh, I look for them and then select plants that are 25 to 30 years old, have endured at least lows of minus 30 multiple times, not just a quick rundown and back up, but multiple times. So, you know, we find a lot of plant material and these, the biggest red buds I have found are in South Dakota, which is amazing to me, whether that be because they don't have disease pressure on them or, or I, I'm, I'm not quite sure what it is, but uh, the nicest ones I have found, and then we propagate from these trees. This would be the last time I ever say this. This is my wife, Lynn. And um, I, you guys probably haven't seen my other talk, or if you've seen any previous talks, I always call her my standard of comparison because she's a five, six wife, <laughs> female. So I put her in all my pictures and say, you know, she's the standard of comparison. And I, I tell people three, four weeks ago, I remeasured her and she's five, five. So she no longer meets my criteria for my standard of comparison. But these are beautiful, incredible trees. And then we also do some uh, seed lot comparisons off other plants. This is a, Minas a Minnesota source, not the available Minnesota source, but another Minnesota source. 
that uh, has been grown out and very extremely hardy as a seed source, it'd be great. Unfortunately, we haven't found the ornamental foliage traits that we want in it. We want superior foliage in all these too, and we, we haven't come up with that. This is a strain that is available for very a very hardy red bud, would do well in this area, and it's just called the Minnesota strain. It's uh, distributed from Bailey Nurseries in Minnesota, and we've had it down into the mid oh, minus 35 area. And beyond that, they get some tipping back, but um, down about 30 to 35 below, they seem to be fully hardy for us. And they're nice trees. These are trees, uh, let's see on the left is in Fargo, young tree on the right is in Watertown, South Dakota. So they, they do very well. Some of these go through the whole selection process and actually make it into the trade. This is one from central South Dakota that I found way back in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, it takes a while to get these trees in. Um, released this with Dr. Dale Herman at NDSU. Got um, grafting wood, propagation wood sent out to a number of nurseries, West Coast nurseries, central US nurseries, and then what they do, they'll propagate the trees and then they grow them out and then they repropagate the trees to see how true they are the second propagation route. This is basically what they do on all their selections. And then they have a committee which determines if they want to use that selection in their program or not. So we were fortunate to have uh, J. Frank Schmidt, one of the leading um, shade tree growers, pick up Northern Herald Redbud. And it's a, it's a very unique tree and uh, very hardy. They initially listed it as a zone 3B, which is not. We encouraged them to go to 4A with protection or 4B um, outright. But the unique, very unique thing about it, here's, here's uh, typical red bud foliage down here, you know, late August, early September in our area. We have such low humidities. Here is, here is Northern Herald. It looks like this all season, just very heavy leathery leaves, very resistant to uh, desiccation. So we, we really like it. And then it's really starting to take off now too. It's, uh, it's available from J. Frank Schmidt and then east side of the country from Hidden Hollow Nursery in Tennessee. So well, hopefully that will keep going for us. I'm gonna jump into some other, uh, just other selections here and some of it has no rhyme or reason at all and some of it does. But I did want to say a lot of the materials that do well for us have names like Manchurian, Mongolian, Siberian. So you kind of get the drift of where this plant material comes from that does well for us. This is an alder that uh, has been, been run through the nurseries for a little while now, and several of them now have really picked up on it. Uh, Prairie Horizon Manchurian alder, and uh, it's Compared to the European alder, it's much more, I don't want to say drought, I never want to say drought, but dry soil resistant. It's, it, it's uh, adapted to drier soils, uh, widely used as a boulevard tree uh, in the northern areas. Bailey's distributes a lot of it and several other West Coast nurseries, but very unique, large, uh, large glossy leaves on it. Very attractive tree. You know, in the wintertime, it's got the... Uh, Excellent form on it. Spring time, you can see it's starting to develop the catkins on it. So it's, it's kind of a neat tree. You know your plants have arrived, and I don't have pictures of it here, when you go to Lowe's or Kohl's or Best Buy, and the trees that are growing in the parking lots are selections from the NDSU program. And it's like, oh, that's really neat. So <laughs> if you can do a parking lot release, that's great. Um, so I mentioned my wife, she's a horticulturalist at Bismarck Parks, and she does tremendous amount of, of tree work and um, is constantly keeping me on my toes as I age and she's younger. But um, she grows them as a multi-stem in this bed. And I, I think they're really attractive that way. And then over on the, uh, on the side here, you can see the pink, the pink male catkins that release the pollen in the spring. And all the alders have these little cones on them, the woody cones, those are the female on them that release the seeds, but uh, very neat plant. Birches, I know you guys don't grow a lot of birch here. When I first moved or when we first moved to Lincoln in, in uh, the early 70s, 71, there were a lot of European white birch here, but the uh, bronze birch boards 
wiped out virtually most of them. Um, birch is used quite a bit as you go further north. This is uh, one out of the program, again, the NDSU India, program is called Prairie Dream Paper Birch. And Dr. Herman went to the western part of North Dakota in one of those 14, 15 inch precip zones on the edge of the Badlands. And you get some of these deeper slopes uh, that get a little more moisture and residual snow that melts slowly. And they, they, there's uh, birch populations in there. So he grew a, a large population of the native paper birch out and then selected uh, Prairie Dream out of that. And it's got very bright white exfoliating bark excellent foliage, um, very nice tree. I have to say after 45 years, we have tremendous bronze birch borer stress in the Arboretum. We're starting to see some bronze birch borer in it, especially after it's removed the other susceptible trees. One thing about bronze birch borer, um, and you're familiar with emerald ash borer, they're very closely related insects. Emerald ash borer is an introduced borer on ash, the bronze birch borer is a native borer to this country. They're in the Grillus group. Uh, also two-line chestnut borer, which is here too. So they've introduced parasitic wasps to try to help control the emerald ash borer. They parasitize the larva under the bark and um, prevent them from developing and, and girdling and killing the trees. Well, a lot of those uh, ash have previously been killed. There's getting to be less and less um, of the larva available, the emerald ash borer. And now, and I haven't seen an actual study, but kind of uh, observational from a number of, of uh, university and arboretum people, those parasitic wasps they brought in are now parasitizing bronze birch borer, which um, may be a good thing. I'm not quite sure yet, but less pressure on birches from bronze birch borer in those areas. So we'll see what happens along that line. River birch, you guys grow river birch. We could not grow river birch until Northern Tribute river birch came out. Again, a tree grown in Western North Dakota, a little town called Dickinson, um, very, very dry. It was grown up in a yard and Dale saw it, grew out of population, selected a uh, specimen of uh, river birch, extremely winter hardy. Um, more tolerant of high pH soils. I'm sure you can get it on some that will gradually get it to be chlorotic, but it's much more tolerant of high pH soils than the typical southeastern uh, river birch. Very nice bark. I love the bark on, on river birch. It's foliating, glossy foliage. So and this is another tree now that people have kind of caught on to its attributes. It's being offered by a lot of the major nurseries, and that's got to filter down to you know, garden centers for, for customers to go in to buy them, but um, really just an excellent, excellent plant. And then one more birch and I'm done with them. This is a, uh, I talked about Dale growing out population, seedling populations. He would bring seed in from all over the world, um, especially with several arboretums, Finland, uh, Poland, uh, Estonia, some of those. I'm not quite sure where is Betula castata um, population came from, but it's another, it's actually another Asian birch that was, he got seed from one of those arboretums. But in growing it out, typically they're a larger tree. This is a genetic dwarf, nine by nine at 30 years of age. And, uh, you know, there's some river birch, Little King and some of those, they are not, they do not do well for us. Betula castata is fully hardy at 40 below zero. So um, it's been picked up. Plus, its uniqueness, you, you had to have a special producer to do it. And if you're familiar with Isley Nursery on the West Coast, kind of the premier producer of dwarf conifers, they picked this up rather quickly. And so they're now offering it in their, in their smaller tree program, which is a real plus for us. But a beautiful little tree as a specimen tree. You know, if you want a small entryway tree or a business with an entryway, whatever it may be. Oh, I do have one more birch. Apologize for that. This is one that we've just come out with, Tianchen birch is from the dry areas of central China. Uh, it's in our birch collection, has virtually had no problems with bronze birch borer. Um, what's unique about it is, you know, we, you go through these drought years, and we've had several of them at the Arboretum, which is west of Fargo. A lot of the birches defoliate and uh, just really struggle with dry soils. Birch and dry soils are not a good combination. This Tianchen birch 
uh, you know, much like the uh, uh, paper birch or, or the uh, river birch earlier, they, they keep this uh, just nice glossy green foliage all summer than a brilliant yellow in the fall. So, and this is now available, um, probably will be available sooner in Canada than here because they have, they're really excited about it. But it's a nice pyramidal birch, um, very good hardiness, very good tolerance to um, dry soils and higher pH. Within that group though, I'm not getting clear out of birch yet, but the family, it's the Betulacea family, the birch family includes a number of different genera. And one of those is Turkey's tree hazel. And these are some trees just right off of East Campus over at the uh, Nebraska Game of Parks building. And just beautiful, beautiful trees. I mean, you need to go over and, and really take a look at them. Um, good uh, pest resistant foliage on them. They put the catkins out similar to the other birches. The fruit on Turkey's tree hazel looks kind of like something you dip out of the ocean. Um, some of the sea anemone or a little octopus or something very, very uh, odd looking. I don't even know how to describe it, but they're a great tree, very great tree. Not hardy in our area. I've killed a number of them, but down here they seem to do very well. And I'm told there's a nice one at the North Platte station. And I'm sure there's others around the state as well. Probably would do well up to about the South Dakota line or a little north of that. Um, I'm a big fan of Aesculus or uh, Buckeyes, whatever you want to call them, Buckeyes we'll say. And I'll go through a few of them. This is um, kind of the one that's the mainstay in the industry right now. It's Autumn Splendor Buckeye. It's actually a hybrid between Yellow Buckeye and Ohio Buckeye. Very high, high foliage quality, um, much less um, susceptible to summer scorch than, than straight Ohio Buckeye or a lot of the other cultivars and gets this nice maroon color in the fall. And there's gonna be, and there already are, more Buckeyes coming on the market now as, for use in diversifying um, urban landscapes. We've been selecting for dip, a better form on them. A lot of the Buckeyes, um, if you have a large yard, they work well for it, but they get pretty wide. Um, we look for crown density in them, so you've got a good head on them. Um, so some of the things we're looking at, more upright and upright growth. A lot of the tree forms are being selected for more upright growth, especially for boulevards. And uh, um, I told the group uh, earlier this week, I call them garbage truck trees because the cities go along and have to trim those so their garbage trucks will clear all these trees. Well, some of these trees, they're really doing a butcher. Well, I don't want to say butcher job. They're doing what they need to do so the garbage trucks can, can get to them. Yeah. Um, so what we're looking for on a number of these, that would be boulevard trees, is more of an upright form. This is a little tree. It's actually been re released through the program. It's in um, increase in several nurseries on the West Coast. Lava burst Ohio buckeye, and that's named because of the bright red in the fall. I actually found this tree in about 2005, just in a yard. And I watched it for a number of years. And then when I went to NDSU, I kind of brought it to the program and ran it through. And uh, so now it, it will be available. It's, it's a much more compact, dense form. And it's not going to uh, get so wide that you can't use it on a boulevard, but you can also use it in parks, uh, school grounds, wherever it may be and make a nice addition. It's got excellent foliage quality on it. Um, these leaves, when you're up close to them, they're very pubescent. So they, they seem to be a little less September or much less susceptible to uh, summer leaf scorch on there, at least what we've seen so far. So that would be interesting. A little one that, uh, that I've said, I don't, it's not common, but if you look on the internet and want a Texas Buckeye, you can find one. And the name is a misnomer. It's an Ohio Buckeye um, from, from Texas, Edwards Plateau. And I think Justin, you mentioned it was thought to be further north than that also. But they, they're a small Buckeye. If you, have, if you really like um, Ohio Buckeye and want a smaller form, Texas Buckeye is, is great for that. It's a, kind of a yellow orange in the fall. But again, we're always looking at these very heavy um, scorch resistant foliage on these. So it's a very nice tree, nice, nice tree. 
dragging them up out of the pole in the summer is that sports typically? Or? Typically, yeah, yeah. It's just the physiological. It's usually um, there may be fungal combined with with heat stress, wind stress. I'm a big fan of Kentucky coffee tree. I wish it wasn't named Kentucky coffee tree because they barely occur in Kentucky. I'd rather see it called American coffee tree. The primary home of coffee tree is the Midwest onto the plains. Uh, so it's well adapted to our region. Um, it uh, used a lot now in urban plantings. So uh, it's got an interesting bark on it. Um, the few times I ever had to climb one of these when I worked with the city as a climber, that and hackberry, man, they just, rip your jeans. So uh, they weren't the funnest to maintain that way. But these are actually, I think, uh, I don't know if these trees are still here. I think this was on downtown campus a few years ago. The big objection by some people to Kentucky coffee tree uh, are the female pods on the tree. And that's objectionable. I don't know. Um, you can rake them up or uh, they hang on and now in April here, they're start, they will start falling in this area as, as new growth starts to push on it. So uh, the push has been for um, selection of male trees that do not produce the pods. And there's a few of them out here. Espresso, Prairie Titan, Stately Manor, Skinny Latte, and Little Joe. And, and I, I think I mentioned all the coffee names for this are a little bit kind of annoyingly questionable because you can't really make coffee out of it. You can make a drink out of it. I don't know if I would call it coffee. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so they're somewhat more upright in form. Um, we lost espresso up north and then uh, Chrissy from the Forest Service, you, uh, Nebraska Forest Service Southwest, they said they had tremendous dieback on them too. So I kind of wonder about espresso. But Prairie Titan is a big tree. Stately Manor is a, is a large upright coffee tree out of the Morton Arboretum in Illinois. That's just now becoming available. Um, you know, if, if the flowers are down low enough where you can see them on both the male and female coffee trees, they, they come out with the foliage so they're not as showy, but they're highly, highly utilized by uh, pollinators. There's bees, butterflies, wasps, everything that will use these flowers on there. So if you have an interest in, in combining trees, which will benefit pollinators, this is certainly one of them. All, all the legumes are beneficial for this. My favorite tree, when I first saw it, I almost fell down on the ground and worshiped it, was this little Joe on the left here. Here's the original one uh, at the Iowa Arboretum, a much, much reduced form of Kentucky coffee tree, multi-stemmed. Um, Plant Select out of Colorado, I think, is interested in picking it up. But we'll see. Right now, the big thing is it's reproduced by root pieces, which is kind of hard to bring a tree into commercial production that way. But maybe they can come up with something on it. But very neat tree over at the Brenton Arboretum, uh, the smaller ones here. If you ever go over to central Iowa, visit the Brenton Arboretum. Their Arboretum is, is a super arboretum, basically cut into prairie. So they've got prairies surrounding their tree collections. It's a really unique arboretum site, very, very unique arboretum site. Um, another legume, and these are, these are from on campus here, is, is yellowwood or American yellowwood, Cladra Cladrastus kentuckia. When I went to school, it was Cladrastus lutea, which it will be forever for me. I can't change this late in life. Um, very neat, smooth bark, long racemes, um, flower racemes on it, and just a gorgeous, gorgeous tree. It, it should be utilized way more than it is. I recommend people plant it where it's got some protection from winter sun, because I have seen some that are damaged by, you know, winter sun on snow, warming up that bark, and then temperature drop and killing it underneath. But there are around here and there. Um, there's one over by the dairy store. That may be, I'm not sure if that's, no, that's not one of these, but uh, also a huge one over on the uh, uh, west part of campus here before you get to the, I don't know if it's still the NETV building on the corner or not, but anyway, there's a big one over there, a huge one over there. It'll be blooming by mid-May, so you need to walk around and look at them and, and see them. Gorgeous tree, though.
Here's some of the flowers, not quite open when I took these pictures. Um, very unique tree, but very hardy. Um, we're getting some growing up where we are, fully hardy in this area. If you go to Union College on 48th, across the street to the west, there's several of them in front of a dentist's office there. I wanted to mention a couple honey locusts. Um, we, when I first moved to North Dakota, honey locusts again was very unusual because the cultivars available were not fully hardy in our area. They would grow, but then at points they'd get damaged and get nitric canker and die back. And the Dr. Herman, again, from a large seedling population, selected several honey locusts out and then grew them out and then selected this one named Northern Acclaim. It's a male tree and it's now used, honey locust is now used clear up into Southern Canada. So it, it jumped a full state north and, and into Canada and its usage. So very, very hardy, um, very, very available too. In fact, it's used countrywide, nationwide. So it's just kind of an interesting one. There's been several that have come out and I've talked about the more upright forms. This one, um, I think originally had a Bratzman nursery in Ohio. Now J. Frank Schmidt has it also as street keeper honey locust. And it's got a much more upright form to it. You can see the branch angles on the, on the uh, left side there. Very nicely upright growing and it, it can be pruned up and above the traffic underneath it. So that's available now. Northern Sentinel, uh, another one. This is Central South Dakota origin. Um, these are my pictures, so they're very bad. I found this tree in Central South Dakota. And um, again, a nicely upright form. Um, J. Frank Schmidt you know, grew it out through the several initial propagation, second propagation, and then evaluation. And actually, this is probably the fastest turnaround in a tree I know. I gave it to them in about 2006 or seven, and it became available in 2020. So um, again, with ash going out, they're looking at trees that we can move into some of those plantings fairly quickly and uh, use them in the diversity of our plantings. I'll do another legume here, Amermachia, the worst name for a tree ever in existence. Um, you say Amermachia, who's ever gonna hear of an Amermachia? But Amur, you've heard of Amur Maple, the Amur River region in uh, Siberia, Russia. Uh, this Machia is the name of the botanist that named the tree initially. It, it could be called Asian yellowwood because it's very closely related to our yellowwood that I just saw or just showed you. And uh, beautiful, beautiful tree, uh, nice pinnate foliage on it. It's a small tree though, 25 by 30. Um, when it first, first comes out in spring, this foliage is a uh, very intense pubescent silvery color. Beautiful, beautiful tree. Uh, the bark on them in the winter, and we look for winter characteristics where we have a seven month winter. Um, you know, that's one of the things we want is, is some winter interest on some of these things. So the bark on it is, is very nice. Then they get these long, long racemes. In, uh, in our area, it, it is in July. Uh, second half of July. So it is blooming when no other trees are in bloom at that time. Um, you know, there may be, a, and certainly are other crops and perennials growing, but um, flower wise on a tree, there's nothing blooming. And, and one day I stood under, whoops, let me go back here, stood under, uh, you know, several of these trees. And uh, I wanted to see what all was coming to them. And there are literally hundreds if not thousands of uh, bumblebees on there. In our area, we have Hunt's bumblebee with the orange band on them. Um, and the whole tree was just, you could just hear it humming. They were so heavy on it. And then we get a lot of other uh, critters, uh, admirals, monarchs, uh, skippers, all kinds of butterflies that come to it for the nectar in those flowers. So as a pollinator tree, when nothing else is offering flowers, it's, it's a great little addition. And there's, uh, there's uh, several cultivars, Magnificent, it's a little more upright, Starburst, Summertime, and now there's one out of Canada called uh, Summer Frost. So they're available, people just do not know about them. And you, it, it's hard to find them in a garden center or a local nursery. And you really need to say, you know, you need to get some of these in and promote them. I know there's one on campus downtown. There's, I saw one uh, 
um, in a planting up near Davenport, Nebraska. Emily, is there any on East Campus here? Okay. Whereabouts would they be? <laughs> Put you on the spot here. Emily knows all the trees on campus. <laughs> Okay. 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 I'll wander around and find it one of these days. Neat little tree. I, I grafted, uh, uh, summertime, a smaller version and put it in my backyard and, you know, on a three foot plant, it was just covered with these flower spikes. I wanted to uh, touch on American elm. Um, you know, American elm, one of our native trees that was just totally decimated by Dutch elm disease. Um, basically, the disease ran its course and those few trees that are left, then people started noticing those. Um, some selections, different groups you can see doing selections on these. Those were then grafted, um, multiple inoculations with the two strains of Dutch elm disease we have in our country, and um, selections that were made that were either resistant or able to compartmentalize that fungal infection, which will kill them. So there's a number of them here, New Harmony, um, Princeton is a very upright one. Prairie Expedition is out of NDSU, Valley Forge. We talked a little bit about Valley Forge out west and I'm in total agreement. I wouldn't plant it unless you're doing, you know, restoration along a river area with multiple cultivars. Valley Forge, the, uh, the crotch angles on it are so narrow, the trees just tend to break apart. Jefferson, there's a couple of new ones. St. Croix out of Minnesota, Colonial Spirit. Um, and I don't know if this is still even offered. There was a series called the American Liberty series, which is the seedling uh, propagated trees. They were not hardy to Dutch elm disease, even though they were touted as that. A little bit about our selection and, and how these selections came about. This is the Wild Rice River south of Fargo. This was all a wooded riparian area with elm. So Dutch elm disease came through there and just ripped through there and basically killed all the elms in this riparian area, which were the predominant trees in the area. There's still some box elders and such through there, but so this one tree was left and uh, Dr. Herman propagated it, grew them up and they did mul again, multiple inoculations with the Dutch elm disease strains. As, as I said, there were two strains and found to be uh, uh, highly resistant in the fact that it can somewhat compartmentalize the disease and shut it off before it does major, any major damage to the trees. So that's now that's widely available in the nursery trade. Uh, this is a street in Fargo. Here you call it Lincoln clay or whatever. In Fargo, we call it Fargo clay. That clay you can take out of a hole if you can get a hole dug and then just squeeze it in your hand. And this is what these are planted on. And this is, uh, this is Prairie Expedition in the middle. These are hackberry on each side. So you can see what that elm is doing. I mean, it's just incredible. And, and Dr. West and I tell everybody, put your nice trees on your best spots, put the elms on the worst spots you have because they, they tend to grow so rapidly and you never want to fertilize them or overwater them. I've seen some of the hybrid elms where people have taken care of their trees and uh, they put on five, six foot of growth. You get a, a heavy, heavy rainstorm with a lot of wind. Then, then you've got all those branches just broken down, almost laying on the ground. So you wanna actually restrict the growth on elm because they are so aggressive. But you know, some of these places that need them, um, they do very well. Princeton is a very upright uh, growing elm. It's uh, widely used. And uh, we did, uh, with Lynn, my wife, we did uh, three years of Western Dakota tree trials of plantings. And, and this tree, I'm trying to remember if it's five or six years old now, you know, Grant was planted as a small tree, but it's doing very well on a, just a park soil and uh, doing great actually. So again, you don't want to push them too much, but they do very well and upright in growth, more of a boulevard type American elm. Um, 
I have a whole spiel where I describe all the Asiatic elms and their hybrids, but that's a whole talk that I give. So I grabbed Japanese elm out of there. Almost Japonica, and you mentioned Almost Davidiana Japonica, and there's a whole Grexer group of, of strains of Japanese elm, some of which are hardy for us, some of which are not. But um, the Asiatic elms, for the most part, co-evolved with Dutch elm disease. Dutch elm disease is not a Dutch disease. It's an Asiatic elm disease. Their elms co-evolved with it, so they're resistant to those strains of, uh, of uh, Ophiostoma ulmi. So if you want to remember that name, yeah. of the Dutch elm disease, you don't need to remember it. <laughs> but so Japanese elm is being used widely. And then hybrids of Japanese elm, which I didn't include in this, but they're widely available, all the Triumph and Cathedral and everything. But this is seedling Japanese elm, but very nice foliage. All of them you see have very nice foliage. They're somewhat highly resistant to elm leaf beetle feeding. Um, one of the ones used a lot in our area and in some of the difficult areas of the high plains is Discovery out of Manitoba. Um, just a nice, uh, it, it's not a huge tree, 40 foot upright branching on them. You're not gonna go in there and get one single perfect stem in there. They wanna come up as a, a denser head on it, but just very nice, extremely hardy tree. Very, very nice, turn a nice yellow in the fall. Um, I wanna again, tout our program a little. Northern Empress is now available from a number of nurseries. This is a small form of Japanese elm. It's actually a Manchurian strain of Japanese elm. 25 to 28 feet in height. You know, it's just remained a small tree, very, very minimal seed production on it. Um, and that's year to year. There's just not much seed on it. And I always uh, tell some of the groups I talk to because I've done some elm breeding. I've tried to find female flowers on here and it's actually hard to find female flowers on this tree. It produces so little, but that's a good thing because these plants, you know, planted in an urban situation you're not gonna get the drifts of elm seed that, that you get from a lot of the others, most of the others, in fact. What we like in the fall, it doesn't turn yellow. It turns this kind of apricot to red into a dark burgundy. So it's a very attractive, uh, different type selection. There's a, there is a uh, hybrid called Frontier that also turns burgundy in the fall, but um, it's not hardy for us. So this kind of extends some fall coloring elms north. So very, very nice small tree. If uh, you want a lot of information on elms, you can just go to this site. We described a lot of the hybrids that are available. If you're really interested in elms or what elm you should plant in your area, it's online, it's easy to bring it up. You can just even type in NDSU extension elms or something and it will come up. Um, you know, we're all familiar with oaks. You guys can grow so many oaks here. It's amazing, you know, the red oak, pin oak, black oak, chinkapin oak, um, uh, bur oak, a lot of oaks. Um, bur oak is native in our area. It's native all the way up um, through the Dakotas into Manitoba and uh, through the states over, over to the western edges, a lot of those states, clear down through Texas. So there's a lot of variation in, in bur oak. Uh, we tend to work with northern sources of it. You know, there's, there's uh, a lot of bur oak that's available and you really don't know what the seed provenance or the seed origin of it is. So you wanna make sure that you're not getting something out of, you know, Texas or even Oklahoma or some of those areas, um, Louisiana or anything. You want a Northern source that does well for you. They get to be a massive tree um, is the big thing of, uh, of it. But um, Beautiful, beautiful tree, and I'm not going to go into many other oaks, but I wanted to touch on that. Up in our area, bur oak, you know, it's a prairie type edge tree. It grows in the in the coolies along there, and uh, mixes with aspen, box elder, um, well, at one time elm, which are gone now. But so it's a very tough plant. It's used to our conditions. It's out there battling with the with the prairie. So it, it does well in our, in our urban environments. There's some cultivars now, as more, more and more people are using bur oak within, within any of these species, people start noticing superior forms. Cultivars are selected, they're grafted, grown out for, for use in ornamental plantings. 
Um, Top Gun is one out of BC or British Columbia um, by a friend of mine, and it's very upright. Urban Pinnacle is also very upright from J. Frank Schmidt Nursery. One called Cobblestone, and I'll talk a little bit about that. And then another one called Bulletproof. And if you look at a lot of the bur oak, they get these gulls on them, called bullet gulls. Well, Bulletproof is out of Colorado, Fort Collins, and uh, hopefully will remain very resistant to those, those gulls. This is Bulletproof. The form is very nice on it. Um, it's available at Fort Collins Nursery in Colorado, so it needs to get spread out a little wider. We put one in in Bismarck a couple of years ago, so they're very cold hardy. It's gone through minus 36 or so as a small tree for us. So hopefully that will maintain that, and then you don't get the really disfiguring bullet galls on it. Cobblestone has a real rough bark, and I kind of chuckled when I saw their release on this because I think a lot of us have seen oaks with bark much more porky than this. I have one along my driveway, which is hard to even see the buds on it. There's so much pork on it. But, you know, at least I, they were trying to get some ornamental attributes in bur oak other than just the species itself. So if you have some winter interest bark on it, that was a big thing. These are the two upright growing ones, Top Gun, and this is a younger, uh, a younger uh, urban pinnacle. I wish they'd update their photo, but very upright again for boulevard type plantings where you'd like to put in a bur oak, but you don't want it reaching the other side of the street and then getting cut back. So you have an upright form there that you can use for those. Prairie Stature is another oak out of our program that it kind of added to the oak usage as you get further north. And it's actually a uh, uh, cross with English and white oak. And that uh, English oak imparts pH tolerance uh, on it. A well, white oak is normally very chlorotic. You get crossed into an English oak, which is, has high pH tolerance in it. Then you get some very nice plants. and. Uh, this is another one that's pretty widely available just as another oak selection. It will get to be a big tree though. This is a large, large tree when it's mature. Calipers up very rapidly, it gets a nice orange fall color on it. Really a neat plant. Um, we grow a little oak uh, oh, on campus and even our state nursery is growing a few thousand a year. Uh, Mongolian oak, it's a extremely cold hardy, small oak, uh, 35 by 30 foot. So, and it's, uh, it's done well for us, uh, adaptable, I say to soil pH uh, seven, six. I've seen it on pH of eight where it's starting to get a little hint of chlorosis on it, but um, it, it does very well. It stays in small form. It's adaptable to smaller campuses, parks, whatever it may be. And um, there's a ton of upright oaks out now, most of which I really don't like, but there are several that I do like. Crimson Spire Oak, Again, this is a cross between the English oak and uh, white oak. And um, very upright growth on it, very, very upright growth, tolerant to high pH soils, um, good foliage on us. Uh, I have heard where it can get some mildew and high humidity, but does very well. And then gets this uh, nice fall color on it, a very nice red. This is uh, kind of the progression that we see on it. I'm seeing more and more of these in, in urban city type plantings in beds. Um, again, some of the parking lot areas in bed, street size. Um, some, of the, some of the upright oaks, I think, are too narrow for some of these wide boulevards. And if you can get something that at least gets some width on it in it. So I like it a lot. Everybody knows hackberry. Um, hackberry, growing up in Kansas, hackberry was pretty prevalent all over the place. And there's uh, just a few cultivars on it, but hackberry is undergoing a big resurgence in use now. Um, as ash has gone out, hackberry is one of the trees that is coming in to take its place. And like I said, there are a few cultivars now with improved uh, foliage quality on them, resistance to witch's broom or nipple gall on it also. Uh, the one that's kind of unique, and I'm not sold on it yet, but it's doing very well, is out of K-State, and it's uh, Prairie Sentinel, very upright growth. You know, and I've seen these on boulevards and you can spot them right away. And at first I was a little hesitant because I think they have kind of narrow branch angles on them, but uh, seems to be doing very well, extremely cold hardy, extremely tolerant. Uh, you know, I think it'd be kind of neat in a, maybe a planting of three or four of them 
in a large bed with some shrubs or something. It'd really give a vertical effect. So interesting tree. I'm gonna throw in pagoda dogwood because I like pagoda dogwood and uh, I have them in my yard. But uh, if you're interested in attracting pollinators, man, there are so many insects that come in on these when they're blooming. You, then you ripen that fruit and then the birds come in and, and strip those off and spread them all over the place. I sat on my deck one day, this is right by my deck, and just watched a flicker just sitting out there just eating fruit after fruit off of it. And then they spread them around your yard. My, uh, my pagoda dogwoods are now no longer in the places they were, but they're coming up in other places. So in fact, I've got to dig up some to, to uh, spread them around to other places this spring. One thing I do want to say, pagoda dogwood is a non-suckering dogwood. You can grow it as a tree form or multi-stem form. So the other dogwoods, rough leaf dogwood, gray dogwood, very aggressive suckering. So in my own crazy mind, I selected a gray dogwood very upright, but very suckering, drafted on pagoda dogwood. And it makes a super small tree. It's just the neatest little thing. And I wish I would have put a slide of it in it. But it is what I told them this morning in our grafting program, rootstocks can do a lot of things. If you have a suckering plant grafted on a plant that's very closely related in that genera that does not sucker, you can create a neat small tree. I haven't been able to get nurseries to really jump on that yet. I need to get a small producer to do that. Um, I threw this in for out west, but it would grow here. Siberian apricot, you know, we think of apricots as the edible apricots, the big ones, or Manchurian apricot, they're edible for jellies and stuff. This is Siberian apricot, small tree, very, very leathery leaves, very hardy, drought tolerant. I don't think this tree has ever been watered. Um, and this is grown in central North Dakota. It's uh, just for a small tree that blooms pink in the spring. We cannot grow any flowering cherries at all. We just do not have the uh, hardiness in it in them for our area. But this can kind of take its place. Um, it does produce fruit, but they're not usable. They're, uh, they're uh, basically a pit with some skin over it, and you can rake it up and throw them away. Um, but it's a neat, neat small tree. You know, if any nursery ever wanted to pick it up and grow a few thousand a year, I can certainly uh, supply seed to it because we have a num number of them around Bismarck. <clears throat> and they all have this kind of uh, unique form to them. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, Australia, you guys are all familiar with Australia maybe. More and more our native Australia or hop horn beam tree is being used in landscapes. Beautiful tree. Um, very unique. You can get a straight trunk. You can get a multi-low, multi-branching low trunk on it. And uh, native throughout the the east, clear over into uh, you know this edge along here, Kansas, Nebraska, kind of fingers out along the Niobrara River a long ways. There's a gap in there; it interrupts it, but then it shows up again in the Black Hills, and it's kind of been a bit isolated in the Black Hills because. When you get out there, the trees, the foliage is, is much more pubescent or much heavier hair on it for, for just plain lower rainfall, lower humidities to prevent leaf desiccation. So again, you're always trying to get producers to grow certain strains of things. And this is one of my wish some of the, uh, the Western nurseries would grow for the front range area because um, these sources from South Dakota and Wyoming, uh, the Black Hills region would do very well out there. And then there is a selection, a more upright selection, Autumn Treasure from J. Frank Schmidt, extremely cold hardy. We put these in, in some of our tree trials and doing very well. So uh, again, with all these trees, as, as they're used more and more, people start noticing superior forms and start doing selections. Here's one that's just about unknown. This, uh, you're familiar with the uh, European smoke trees, um, you know, with the kind of puffy panicles and different uh, foliage colors. This is the American version. You rarely come across this. It is available. It's offered in the nursery trade in places. Um, but just a gorgeous, gorgeous tree. Big, uh, you know, bluish green leaves on it. Nice fall color. These are, these are in North Dakota. So they're doing this up there. So it should be adaptable here. It's one of those trees you get it established and then just let it grow. You don't give it a lot of help. You don't want to push it. Just let it do its thing and slowly do its thing. Um, 
It's not like a big pollinator tree or anything, but just for a unique plant for a landscape. Super, super plant. Mountain ash, you know, mountain ash used to be a big uh, nursery tree, garden center tree, the European mountain ash. They'd grow a while, get fire blight, break apart, take, taken out, and people would buy another one, I guess. But this is the Korean mountain ash, um, totally different form, very upright in growth. Uh, the, the leaves on it are single leaves, look almost like an elm leaf on it. Nice white flower clusters, so you get a lot of pollinators coming in. Uh, nice upright growth on it. Just a neat small tree. Again, it's available, but so few places carry it that it's you know never really offered. In the fall, orange, you have this uh, fruit that hangs on for several months into or just after the uh, first of the early part of the year. It's usually picked off by then. And I think I mentioned in the other, in, in McCook, I've seen wax wings come into these things and just strip them. Um, there's small fruit that they can eat. So another neat small tree. I don't think we need all large trees or all small trees, but um, you know, it, it's very unique. Catalpa briefly is kind of making a comeback. Catalpa was kind of a conservation tree and a very early, early landscape tree, and then fell out, fell out of favor with all the ash and, and other trees. But now coming back, uh, Schmidt Nursery has a uh, improved form called Heartland. I think this is out of uh, Northeast Kansas, actually, Hiawatha area. So that's available. There's seedlings available, the, you know, the flowers. We always would get calls every year when these things were flowering. And what is that tree with the flowers on it? So uh, wanted to put cucumber magnolia in too, which I know there's been a few of them around here. That's not as widely known in our area, but uh, these trees actually on, on this side are University of Wisconsin Arboretum. Very nice form, kind of an upright, you know, pyramidal form. Uh, so whoop, let me go back here. Um, we've collected a lot of seed off of these trees and propagated them. And uh, my wife, Lynn, will you know, endure me and put all my trials out in her parks. And, and she does an excellent job of taking care of trees. This tree is maybe six to seven years old from seed and just doing very well in, in, in Bismarck. Sailed through our minus 36, minus 37 a few winters ago. Um, you know, she does get them watered and established, but basically growing on river sand. It's got the neat large leaves on them. Neat, neat native tree, native to the eastern U.S. Cork tree. I don't know if you use much cork tree down here. We do in our area. Uh, Philodendron amaranthus. There's also Soclinensis. Um, kind of a neat small tree. Um, Obviously, the tree over here is much larger. That's an old, old tree, but uh, uh, very adaptable, very pH adaptable. There's cultivars, uh, eye stopper, His Majesty, and Macho. And what you want to do is make sure you get the male cultivars because the females are very invasive. They produce small fruit on them that are taken by birds and, and can actually be in suitable areas, an invasive tree. It's not invasive as you get further west, but uh, back east more. Uh, a linden, we use a lot of linden, um, both American and little leaf, but this is Mongolian linden out of Manitoba, Jeffrey's Nursery in Manitoba. Um, just super, super tree. It doesn't get as big as the other linden, 35, 40 foot. And then go through some tree lilacs here. I'll start wrapping some of this up. Pekin tree, li tree lilac. There's two tree lilacs, Pekin tree, li tree lilac and Japanese tree lilac. Both of them do very well, both of them very winter hardy. The, uh, the peaking, a number of the cultivars have this very coppery exfoliating bark. So it's a very attractive winter bark on it. Um, this one is, is copper curls from our program. Uh, Summer charm, China snow also have that, that type of bark on them. Very unique. Tree lilacs are used very, very heavily up in our area because they can take horribly abusive conditions. Um, boulevard plantings, there's a, there's a row that has been in Bismarck for probably a good 30 years along one of our main expressways. It's all the exhaust, all the salt, everything that can be thrown at it. And every year they just bloom and grow away and 
go on and say, I'm happy here. So they really endure some tough situations. Uh, there's an, again, you know, a lot of these trees have a number of cultivars. Ivory silk is kind of the standard small Japanese tree lilac. Uh, snow caps, a very heavy flowering one out of Oregon. Ivory pillar is a uh, upright one, to about 18 foot or snow. Snow dance is seedless. There's some concern in some of the uh, far Eastern US states about uh, Japanese tree lilac going off site and is it invasive or not? Still no um, real consensus on it. Snowstorm and then golden eclipse is a variegated one. So there's a number of different cultivars available. We've got one through our program. Um, this actually a tree form Japanese tree lilac instead of the 15, 20, 22 foot, this is 30 to 35 foot in height. And um, we're getting this, it's now being initially propagated. Uh, they're trying it by tissue culture, then also by cutting. So, you know, for those areas for boulevards where you need a really tough, not large tree, but a tree that's very tolerant of tough conditions, this would be one to plant nicely upright in form. Oh, maples, I forgot. Um, we cannot grow the Japanese maples up north the, uh, with all their cultivars, all the leaf forms, color forms, but we can grow the very close cousin uh, Korean maple. So this is a zone 4A tree. Mine have gone through minus 42. So they're very winter hardy. They um, get a nice fall color on them. You know, the, uh, the leaves initially emerge. They're very pubescent and droopy and then uh, nice green all summer, and then the orange to red in the fall. And this is a cultivar called Northern Spotlight. Seedlings of uh, Korean maple also do, also do very well, as long as it's from a cold hardy source. A little bit about sugar maples. Um, I won't put a lot in here, but Fall Fiesta out of Minnesota is one of the standards. Northern Flare from NDSU is widely available from several nurseries. Unity is a great one, but I don't think it's down here. And then Apollo. Um, a little bit about sugar maple selection. Sugar maple is native clear to the East Coast. So a lot of the sugar maple that's in the trade, the seed for either growing those or for the rootstocks comes from Pennsylvania. So we bring these seedlings out here or rootstocks out here from Pennsylvania, stick them out on the plains, and then we wonder why they don't do well here. So. They need to be grafted onto like Iowa, Minnesota sources for ensuring hardiness. This is a stand of sugar, well, the seedlings from a stand of sugar maple. The westernmost range of sugar maple in the north is in the Sisseton Hills in Northeast uh, South Dakota. It's a glacial remnant area, um, still down in the cool canyons, there's sugar maple and hazelnut, a lot of relics that as the climate changed and became prairie around it, they persisted in those areas and gradually over thousands of years somewhat adapted to at least the conditions they were growing in. So uh, again, Dr. Herman grew out of population, selected Northern Flare out of it. So it's a very tough Northern origin sugar maple. Bailey's has Fall Fiesta, which is another really good sugar maple. In our area, I found sugar maples to do better than the Freeman maples like Autumn Blaze and some of those. Um, they just seem to be a sturdier, more tolerant tree. I always like to throw in Apollo sugar maple, very small tree, 25 to 30 foot in height, but that's gonna take a long time to get there. So if you have a very limited space for a sugar maple, a unique sugar maple, very dense Apollo is, is a neat one. And that's again, widely available in the production nursery end of the trade. So you gotta kind of look for it. And then one more sugar maple, sweet shadow, cut leaf sugar, Everybody on our tours always asks us what this is. Here's the leaf of sweet shadow. This is typical sugar underneath. So it's a very, very unique. They get this orange on it, fully hardy, extremely hardy sugar maple selection. It's actually, I think out of New York, but very hardy uh, winter cold. And then down in Oklahoma, the Southern range of uh, sugar maple goes out to West, West Central Oklahoma in uh, the, uh, the Red Rocks Canyon area, Cato County, Oklahoma. And so there's been selections out of that, the uh, Kansas State uh, Center, uh, south of Wichita, John Pear, when he was alive in there did selections. He 
he selected John, John, well, they named it for him after he passed away. John Perez on the right, flash fires from J. Frank Schmidt. The interesting thing about these, we have these grown in North Dakota. Why they will grow and tolerate, you know, minus 35, minus 38, I have no idea. And they start changing foliage color at the same time as our early Northern selections of sugar maple. So it baffles me in their hardiness and their photo period shutdown time, but, but they're unique maples. Um, and Justin, was it you saying you thought they did well? Or I think Bruce was saying they did well in the Western part of the state here. So there's potential for some of these heat tolerant sugar maples to be used also. State Street uh, is a beautiful maple out of uh, the Morton Arboretum. Um, very nice, very nice, clear yellow fall color. It's an Asian species, but uh, very tolerant to urban conditions. Three flower maple is a maple I really like. It's another, it's a North Korea Manchurian type uh, um, trifoliate maple. If, are you guys familiar with paper bark maple at all? Um, with the exfoliating bark? Well, this is its close cousin. Paper bark maple is not hardy beyond zone five. Three flower maple is listed as zone five, but it's fully hardy in zone three B. Uh, so it's a beautiful, beautiful tree. The big thing about it is it's got bark like a birch on it, this um, vertically striped uh, kind of a golden bark up and down it. It's, uh, I've got a large one on the side of my house that I thought would not be hardy, so I planted it close to my house. So now it's, you know, 28 foot tall and goes over the side of the top of the house, and, but I just can't cut it out yet because Winter time, the bark on it is just so spectacular. So they're really grown for winter bark. They do get a good fall color though too, but very, very nice hardy tree. I wanna throw in another native American fringe tree, Cayenanthus. Boy, if you like things that flower in June in our area, maybe late May here, this is the American version. There's also a Chinese version. Um, just beautiful, beautiful flowering plant. Um, it's in that same family as ash and lilac and all those. Some cases where they uh, found it to be susceptible to emerald ash borer, other arboretums in the east say we haven't had any problem with it at all. And I always say it's not going to get that big here either. You can cut it down in five seconds, you know, with a sharp hand saw if it's really a problem to you. But they just get covered with these white, uh, white flowers on them, just beautiful. And then the blue fruit that are hang on into the winter and taken by birds. So. Very, very nice plant. And then the, the last deciduous one is one called Yellowhorn, Xanthocerus sorbifolium. And I always throw it in and I stole these slides. This page from Tim McDonald, K-State, when we gave a talk at McCook in 2019, we had a lot of the same trees for Kansas and North Dakota and for the plains. And Yellowhorn was one of them. This is one you gotta look for. Um, you know, it, it, it is there, it's available, very unique flowering small flowering tree, you can trim it into the form of an ammer maple. So on the left side here is, is yellow horn in North Dakota. Here's one over here on East Campus. Well, we're on East Campus, over here across from the uh, uh, dairy store over here. So they do, they do very well, very, very well, very unique tree. A little bit about conifers, needle cast um, is our big thing. We have three diseases, Rhizophera, Stigmina, and Cytospora. Um, so there's always something attacking them. And, and you know, the big, a big percentage of trees planted in urban plantings in North Dakota, what do they want? Well, the number one is Colorado spruce is what they want. I mean, and I tell people it's like living in a spruce forest in these towns and they put in deciduous trees with them. Um, it's just so heavy, but now we've got needle cast disease moving in, in a number of areas. So we're kind of emphasizing tempering the use a little bit. Um, we have a selection out of the NDSU program. Uh, it's called Norway spruce. That's really, we don't think it is a Norway spruce, but a very upright form, um, very, very hardy, a beautiful tree. And it doesn't get the drooping branches, but it's resistant to all those needle cast diseases. So it's available now, it's in production, very nice short needle. But the biggest problem, and you can see it in this picture, what does it lack? It lacks blue needles. So everybody wants blue. 
And if you have something green, that's really a hard sell. But we hope it, that people can start seeing the advantage of having needles on a tree and not die in your yard. And then uh, Meyer spruce um, and Asian spruce, we're kind of promoting it a little bit as tempering the use with Colorado spruce. You get all these neat purple cones on them at a young age, really, really neat. So, and the biggest thing with Meyer spruce, if you grow a hundred seedlings, you get a hundred forms out of it. Everything from, you know, white as a truck to pyramidal. So slowly, slowly, I'm trying to find more upright blue forms of Meyer spruce that is resistant to the needle cast diseases. So, um, Swiss stone pine, uh, Pinus sembra is from the Alps in Europe and uh, some other disjunct populations, but an extremely hardy, dense, upright, five needle pine. So it's a white pine is actually what it is. Um, very, very unique tree. Um, and there's a number of cultivars and in, in my conifer talk, I have the other cultivars. There's, there's a number of others, chalet and compacta and a number of cultivars that have been selected for for form and growth. Um, prairie statesman will actually get, you know, 40 foot tall. So it, it can be a large tree eventually. The biggest thing about these uh, Pinus sembras, um, after our, what was it, spring of, it was winter of 18, 19, 18 and 19, not 18, 19, but 18 and 19, um, we had a, uh, we had a lot of snow, but intense sun for a good part of the winter and the up and down temperatures, but just a lot of reflected sun on foliage. And every conifer we had was either burnt to death or the uh, southwest sides of them were just almost defoliated by sun. These Pinus sembras, the Swiss stone pine, we could not find a brown needle on any of them, on any of the cultivars. And they, some of these are just planted in totally full sun. There's several planted in, in Bismarck at the top of one of the, uh, there are hills in town, actually. And, uh, and on the back side of it is a mirrored building. So it's getting light from both sides in the winter, just intense. They, they look great, didn't bother them at all. So if you have a problem in your area with winter sun burning on some of these, we even had winter sun burning on Ponderosa pine and Colorado spruce that, by that spring. So it was pretty intense. And then uh, another conifer here, um, just another one to use is, is Douglas fir, but this is a selection of Douglas fir called Green Canyon, very dense upright stems on it. And, and that's in uh, production now by Oregon Pride Nursery. So, so the conifers are a big, big part of it. So my wife loves trees, so she gives them a kiss always. Um, biggest thing you can do for your trees is to keep them mulched and uh, People always say, well, how much, how much area do you want to mulch? As big as you can get, take your lawn out and mulch it. You know, put some, put some perennials underneath it, but, but do the best you can. And then uh, that's pretty much it on that. I have a couple more minutes, if you can bear with me. I want to talk about this the, uh, uh, Steamboat Trace Trail in Southeast Nebraska. My brother John here is with me too. And here's his wife with me. Um, the Steamboat Trace Trails in Southeast Nebraska. And what's the nearest town, John? Peru? My, well, yeah, okay. Runs along there. It's an old railroad grade. These trees along the side are all pawpaw, if you're familiar with pawpaws. Uh, native along there get to be fairly, fairly large, large groves. Um, you know, those, those trees are quite sizable, the stems in there. So along this trail, trail, uh, we were walking. Here's a pawpaw. If you're not familiar with pawpaws, Nebraska banana. And um, walking. And then we started finding uh, shells from butternut, too. And that's kind of odd because you don't anticipate running into butternut in that area. And as we looked around a little more and we went back several times and had to collect herbarium specimens uh, to prove that it was butternut, you know, it was... Uh, um, number of butternut trees and you can see the size on them and then number of uh, other trees in the area, smaller trees. So we submitted herbarium samples and I think Dr. Call was the one that finally gave us the thumbs up. Oh, were you involved? Rachel. Rachel? Okay. 
Okay. Well, anyway, so yeah, so we had butternut and uh, it is a reproducing tree in that area. It is native across the Missouri River, but it had not been found in Nebraska. So we have a new native species for Nebraska. We brought in the big guns, Jim Locklear from Lorenzen Gardens to collect a bunch and grow out. And uh, it was real fun, you know, finding, actually being part of finding a species that's now considered a native, at least in that, that area there. And uh, so that's great. Who knows what, what else is lurking down there. So, so that's all I got. What time of year? Uh, this was fall and it was um, probably around October plus or minus 10th or so when the fruit, uh, we were actually collecting the fruit that was down. It may have been more towards mid-October too, 15th or so. As long as it takes. I would say anybody who wants to go ahead, but let's trim this guy a little bit. I'll maybe make some help with the Zoom, but I want to. Yeah, let's shut off your. Yeah, get me out of here. Get you out of there. And then we all. Yeah. Okay. They were, um, How do I they get? Were like multi-stem branches, the trunks were short at the bottom, and oh, yeah, multi-stems. Had those been pruned up so that we could see? Only, only the lower part. Her question was if those some of those multi-stemmed uh, that branched low had been pruned up, just to get mowers around them. That we let them grow in their natural form because we want to see what they're going to do. So, and they can be pruned and they can be thinned out and probably make a better example out of them. But no, they were basically left on their own. Um, you know, in all these programs, you want to see what's the tree going to do? You know, what are its weak points? Is it going to have narrow crotch angles? going to have wide? Is it going to split apart? Whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, some of them are beautiful. I'd like to see them in landscapes. <laughs> you have some questions online here. I don't know if you want to just turn around and read. One okay. person's asking about, there's all this, Doug Tallamy talk about, Native plants mm -hmm. sustaining polymers. You can read that, or is that a concern with some of the trees you're talking about? Pretty much everything I've shown, um, they're not all native, obviously. And I live in an area where if we grew only native trees, I'd have maybe six trees. Right. Um, so we emphasize a lot of adapted, uh, non invasive trees for our area. And as I said, on some of those, like the Amaramachia. It's probably, I've seen more pollinators on Amramachia than I've seen on any other native tree even. But, and you look at the other, other legumes, Kentucky coffee tree, honey locust attracts a lot of insects to it. You know, anything with the flowering uh, um, nature to it that's visible to the insects and produces either pollen or nectar as a reward for them, they're gonna come to it. So, yeah. Question about Nissa. Nissa or black gum and ginkgo. Uh, Nissa is the next big tree, black gum. Um, it's a native tree to the east uh, and southeast. It does occur clear up through, I think, into New Jersey and some of that area. But um, I don't have it in here because it is not hardy in our area with the exception of a few that we're trialing. But it's a very, Nissa is a very nice plant. It's a large tree, though they are selecting cultivars of it. Beautiful glossy foliage, intense, uh, intense red generally in the <clears> fall. But then again, it's a nice native uh, tree that's probably well adapted to this area. Um, ginkgo, same way. Um, there's a lot of cultivars of ginkgo. Ginkgo is a lot of pest and disease resistance. So it's widely used in a lot of the um, urban plantings now on boulevard plantings, uh, parks plantings, um, very ancient tree covered this whole area, you know, 60 million years ago, there were ginkgos all over here. And then gradually as, as uh, plate shifted and climates changed, it was restricted more and more to some valleys in China where it was found and then propagated from there. So um, neat tree, yeah. Uh, um, uh, Yellowwood does quite well in Chadron. Good. 
Yeah, yellow wood, it just should be used more. I, and I don't know why it's not. There are several cultivars of yellow wood. So you can go out to these trees grown on campus. Uh, they have a lot of pods on them and uh, just collect the pods, rub the seeds out, just kind of nick them so they absorb water and uh, uh, fairly easy to grow. They grow rapidly. Takes a little while to get flowering from seed. It may be eight, 10 years before they flower from seed. Grafted ones um, tend to bloom a lot sooner. There is a cultivar called Perkins Pink also that blooms pink rather than the cream colored flowers. So it's another one that uh, so far has done well. I've stuck one in my backyard and I had one little flower on it this last yeah. spring. So it was a big deal for me. <laughs> we planted that one last year. The one is like out by in the front by the the columns on the campus. All right. Okay. You mean here on campus here. we planted it. Okay. Yeah, out in the in the white barn. Extension from the wall. Okay. Front. The species or Perkins Pink? Pink. Okay. Perkins Pink. Okay, yeah. good. Good, good. Yeah, good. we just started. We yeah. Tried. Yeah, well, I'm interested to see if, if the, the hardiness is the same as in the species. I mean, I don't know where it originated from. Some of these trees have really odd ranges. Yellow wood is another one that that's a, it's a southern tree. There's disjunct populations in Missouri and Oklahoma. You know, it must have had a wider range at one time, but you end up with just a few populations. And who knows where the seed came from for the, what we're growing now. But uh, same with that. I showed you that. Uh, American smoke tree again, you know, Tennessee and Oklahoma and you know, down in that area. And yet it survives, you know, zone 3B for us. So uh, you kind of scratch your head sometimes and think maybe they were wider spread at one time. And as glaciers push things south, they retain some of that genetics for cold hardiness in them. But uh, yeah, interesting. Got a quick, uh, kind of a quizzical question for you, Greg. <laughs> Uh, we talk about this all the time. You know of all these wonderful trees, and you've even introduced some to the industry, and yet it, we don't see them being used a lot. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts about how we might improve them? Yeah, I, it, it, uh, most of these that I showed are available, with the exception of a few that are in the process of becoming available. It's it's getting people to ask for them. Uh, it's getting you know into your local garden center or whatever and say. You know, this is a tree I'm interested in growing that you should be able to get it from your suppliers. It, you know, you may need to let them know a year in advance and get them to order in a bundle. I mean, you have to order these things in, you know, large trees in multiples of fives or tens. So, you know, they're going to have to have a customer for at least a, a bundle of them. But um, it, it, a lot of these is getting people to ask for them, too. And that has worked really well in our area further north, and now we need to move that further south. But, you know, our nurserymen in the Dakotas, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, um, you know, Quebec, uh, all of those know our program really well, so they look for those trees. And uh, there are producers of a lot of these others, uh, Catinus, uh, the American um, uh, smoke tree heritage seedlings grows thousands of them a year, and I don't know, they're going somewhere. Yeah. You know, people are growing them out, lining them out. When, when you grow these plants, a lot of them need to be lined out for several years in a nursery setting before they harvest them. But it, it's just getting them in the pipeline. And uh, yeah, we don't want to show things that are not going to be available. You know, and trifolia maple, it's um, Acer triflorum, three flower maple, that's available. But again, it's, it's looking for it too. And I found some of them, if you go online and start looking for them, there are nurseries, you may be buying a smaller one, of some of these, but they do carry them too. Okay, so um, that these are tried for and you can order it yourself. Um, yeah, from you've just got to yeah get into a uh, um, maybe a maple specialty nursery or cold hardy nursery, and they are available. Yeah, because I I tend to look for them and see what I can find. So. I love that tree. Yeah, yeah it's in, it's incredible. I don't know why that it's so much more adaptable than than paper bark maple. So yeah, die back on paper bark here today. Yeah. But Nickerson asks, have you been out to the Cheyenne station and any thoughts on the trees growing out there? Or? 
Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, the uh, ARS had a station at Cheyenne, Wyoming. They also had one at Mandan, Mandan North Dakota, and they had similar programs, uh, cold hardy fruits and ornamentals for the high dry plains. Mandan shut their program down and removed almost everything. Um, the Cheyenne station, some of those plantings are still in place. And it's really interesting to walk through there and, and see what is there. And Scott Skogerbo from Fort Collins Nursery has gone through and selected a number of those plants and, and increased those. And so there, there's some very interesting plants there. Russian hawthorn, um, Sutherland, Carragana, uh, plants with unique fruit, unique, unique form on them. So yeah, very, very neat. And last question, I hate to cut this short, we've got the room for just a couple more minutes, but uh, I can't think of any questions. <laughs> can you recommend the uh, online nursery that might carry some of these? There are so many of them. Oh, they really are, yeah, yeah. You really you just need to go in and, and you know, Google such and such for sale or whatever. And um, there, there are a number of nurseries, and we need more nurseries, small nurseries, and we need small nurseries here producing material for the plains itself. I mean, that would be a big, and we do have some now, but, uh, you know, that actually are propagating some of these plants, some of the superior selections and uh, truthfully, some of the plants I select are not going to be used out of the plains. Now, a lot of them are, like the honey locusts and those, but there are some plants that will be used mostly in the plains just because they do well here, but they're not going to do well back east, or they're not going to do well in the south. But if we had local propagators to do some of those, that that's the big stumbling block on getting a lot of those available, is, is needing some local propagators. When I say local, I mean this whole region the central and northern plains, the uh, front range of the Rockies. Feels like the nursery industry just pumps all this common Yeah, it is. And that, everything, but there's these needs. Yeah, yeah. The nursery, and not bad mouthing the nursery industry at all. I mean, they're all businesses, but right. most of the growth is in, you know, certain areas of the, of the Intermountain area and then the Southeast. So they want trees that they can grow in that intermountain area, and then they want zone six and seven trees for the southeast. And that just doesn't do well at all for us. So. I noted, like, going to Tennessee, they have all that wonderful native native plant population. It's still one of the most commonly planted trees is the ornamental pear. Yeah, yeah. A lot of Chinese stuff. Yep, yeah. Yeah, and, you know, and, and those areas that have such potential with native plant material, and and there are there are there are nurseries that are working a lot with that. It's just you know getting them to distribute out of their ranges too. But yeah. Most of these trees are for urban environments, but are there trees amongst those that the Forest Service or the NRCS or the NRD could start producing? Because they used to be an awful lot of trees. Yeah. There's um there's two things with that. Yeah, some of them are if they can be propagated by seed. And some of them are propagated by conservation nurseries. Um at least they were at one time. I'm not sure if they still are. The Korean mountain ash, the Amermachia has been done that way. Um there's more pressure to as farms get bigger, more trees are pushed out, there's less trees going into conservation plantings, and that's narrowed the uh, offering of what they have to grow. So, yeah, I mean, any of these could actually be planted out in a conservation type planting, but you may be buying larger trees too. But to get them widely available, they have to have seed available, number one, and then to be able to acquire enough seed to grow them by the tens of thousands at a minimum. So I did that for 29 years. And when you're cranking out, you know, three, four million seedlings a year, you've got to have a lot of seed of plant material that's adapted. And so, yeah, but these are mostly, I would consider them on the ornamental end, but even, even people's farmstead plantings, instead of just one species around it, you could use a lot of these and, and mix them up and have a, you know, a nice, multi-row planting around a farmstead too. Okay. Well, thanks again. Yeah, yeah, thank you guys.
coming. There's only seven there. Okay. Leave meeting. They are hardy, but they don't like their faces. Yeah. Right. So but if you get one of my spiders, yeah. Yeah. Like first Yeah, I never so never heard about 
It's one of the things that I grew up and they've been doing that on campus. Yeah. Yeah. But even so, we might have to put water because we had some. I think there's still some. Yeah. 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 Yeah.